to you live from Purdue University with our It's a Gene Thing Zip Trip. I'm Jessica, your Purdue Zip Trip Guide. Now we have students all over the country watching this broadcast. Just take a look at this. Hales Corners Lutheran Middle School, are you guys there? Go! <laughs> yeah, I love to see that pride. Are you guys ready to have some fun today? Well, while we cannot see all of you out there, today's Zip Trip is interactive and you have a chance for your voices to be heard. Now, if you have a question for any of the scientists, you can email them into us here at the show. Now, this Zip Trip is all about genetics. Do you know what a scientist who studies genetics does? Well, today we're going to find out. First, we are going to meet a young geneticist who's on a team researching the mechanism that allows some plants to thrive in soil with high levels of poison like arsenic. Then, we'll connect with a laboratory right here on campus where something fishy is going on. Finally, we'll work with Purdue wildlife experts, outdoors and indoors, to use our scientific inquiry skills to help solve a genetics case about these unique amphibians. There are many geneticists working right here and studying here at Purdue, and joining me now is one of them, Nadia Atala. Hi, Nadia. Hi, Jessica. Thanks for being here today. Thank you so much for having me. This is your first time with Zip Trip, so we're so lucky to have you. Now, you don't look like a normal scientist, so what's your story? Well, I'm a scientist and also a graduate student studying plant genetics here at Purdue in the Department of Botany and Plant Pathology. We all start out learning the Punnett Square. Do you all know about the Punnett Square? Do you guys know anything about the Punnett Square? Well, it looks like we may need a refresher. Right. So here's a quick example on how a Punnett Square works. This okay. one's using mice. Great. Let's take a look. The Punnett Square is a diagram that is used to predict an outcome of a particular cross or breeding experiment between two individuals. So we do a lot of knockout experiments, mm -hmm. and so we knock these genes down, and then we look at the phenotype. Knockdown experiments can tell you a lot about a gene's function. Okay. So let's check in with Hales Corners School. Do you guys have any questions for Nadia? Yes, we do. Um, in your video, you mentioned reverse genetics. So what exactly is now before we go to our next scientist, I have a quick genetics activity for us to try. So do this with me. I want you guys to pull on your earlobes like this. And I want you to see if your earlobe is attached or detached. What about you? Is it attached? Detached. Attached. Well, let's go ahead and check in with our hot seat and see what they are saying. Abby. Our poll shows that 75% of our hot seat users have attached or have non-attached uh, earlobes while 25% have attached. Well, just like humans, there are some animals who like to travel and some who don't. A scientist here at Purdue is trying to find out more about fish and what makes them swim in some pretty unique places. Joining us live from his lab in the Lily Hall of Life Sciences here on campus is fish geneticist Matt Hale. Hey, Matt. Hey, Jessica. And can you wave hello to everyone who's watching? Sure. Hey, everyone. Hey. Hi. So, Matt, can you tell us a little bit about where you are? Sure, so I'm in the Lilly Building uh, here at Purdue University, the main campus in West Lafayette. And here in the Lilly Building is where the Department of Biology is kept. And here there are many different scientists working on answering many different questions in biology, from some people who work on cancer, some people work on photosynthesis, and some people work on animals. So we've got people here working on amphibians, some people work on birds, as well as several different scientists who work on fish. Now, your job takes you to all sorts of cool places, and I hear you have a really cool project going on right now. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, definitely. So the main project I'm involved with here at Purdue is out in Alaska, not far from the town of Sitka, okay. which you guys are seeing some pictures of now. So Beautiful. this is really, really remote. You can't get there via a car. There are no roads. You've got to get there by a float plane, these small float oh, planes. Wow. Do you guys have any questions for Matt? Uh, yes, you sitting on the floor. Um, have you found any dominant genes that, like, when the migrating fish and the resident fish mate, have you found like a dominant gene that will find if it's go if the offspring is going to be a resident or a traveler fish? That's an excellent question. With us here today are Purdue wildlife geneticist Andrew DeWoody and Rod Williams. Hey guys. A wildlife geneticist use DNA to study secretive animals. 
awesome. Secretive animals. So you guys also study another mysterious or secretive creature, and that is the salamander, right? That's right. Rod, can you tell us about salamanders? Sure. Where do they live? Uh, first, there's a lot of different species of salamanders, mm -hmm. over 600 worldwide. Wow. And while they can be very similar, they also have some very striking differences. It's alive! This is a species that spends part of its life in the water and as a juvenile and part of its adult life on land. They only go back to water in the spring to try to find a mate, lay their eggs in the water. Well, this is a tiger salamander egg mass. If you look closely, you can actually see the individual embryos within this egg mass. We can take a small tissue sample from these embryos, in addition to the tail snips from the adults, back to the lab, extract DNA, and then conduct the parentage analysis. And DNA offered a great uh, opportunity to learn more about their biology. Very cool. Okay, well, out of our studio audience, I want to know who does not find a salamander creepy? Anybody? Anybody want to come touch it? So I want you to Austin? touch the tiger salamander. How does it feel? Slippery and wet. And now let's check in with Hale's Corners. Do you guys have any questions for our scientists? Yeah. Can some salamanders be poisonous and will it affect the research? Will, can some salamanders be poisonous and will it affect their research? Many species of salamanders will secrete a, 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 a slight toxin from their body and they use that to deter predators. Push, push. 